Welcome to another installment of the Amateur Academic. I'm your host, Barbara St. Clair. Here at the Amateur Academic, our goal is to educate the public to make better decisions. That's it. That's what we do. Now, you can always ask the Amateur Academic on Facebook, Twitter, Quora, or even LinkedIn with my name, Barbara St. Clair. We've got a question that we found was very interesting here at the Amateur Academic. In which area will nanotechnology create the most wealth? Now, I've personally, as the amateur academic, written a lot about nanotechnology. Make sure to check out in the comments below my research. And if you check out up at the top, you're going to see links to my nanotechnology YouTube videos. So you click them. Please click my videos. That is a very difficult question to answer because we need to put some limits on what is nanotechnology and what time frame and so on and so forth. So I've actually decided as the amateur academic to combine it with another question. What are some startup ideas for the pharmaceutical industry? Well, I think you can see what we're going to do here. Maybe you don't. But this is going to be a really cool video. Let's drop the title of this massive tomb. Future nanotechnology, economic forecasting methods, financial forecasting of innovative and disruptive technology on established industries, explaining forecasting methods with a case study of nanotech and the pharmaceutical industry to predict new markets and investment opportunities. Woo! Oh, okay. That's a mouthful, but that was necessary to get that out. All right, let's get straight to the outline. Number one, we're going to talk about what is nanotechnology. Number two, we're going to talk about future forecasting models. How do we actually make models about predicting the future of industries and technology? Number three, we're going to talk about nanobiotech and the economic predictions for the pharmaceutical industry. Question, why well, believe me? I mean, who the hell am I? Well, I happen to have the hottest trending research paper on predicting the future of nanotechnology on the internet. Secondly, I just love innovation and disruption research on future tech and emerging markets. I love blockchain, nanotech, rare earths, semiconductors, machine learning, and so much more. I really get down with the mathematics of information theory, dynamical systems, knowledge extraction, physics, forecasting, and analysis. But I'm a regular guy, okay? I'm not like some super genius or something. So you can do this too, you just have to want to do it. And that's kind of the point of the amateur academic. This is not investment advice, okay? So I'm totally free. Are we cool? We're cool. All right. Let's move on to step number one. What is nanotechnology? The precise manipulation of matter under one micrometer. Two, let's get into the actual forecasting models of innovation and disruption making future predictions. Now, how the heck do we do that? Structure is everything. The most compact, best language for structure is mathematics. If you have a fair coin toss, how much can you know about the future? How much knowledge do you have? It's 50-50. That doesn't really let you predict any future events. This is the degree of truth of the inference. This is the measurement of the probability that some knowledge is true, ranging from 0 to 1. This can be assumed or it can be tested once the knowledge is applied to data beyond the original scope of the knowledge acquisition. I would just love to give a shout out to Professor Dr. Andrew Doc Andy Edmonds. He was the first person to introduce me to the concept of inference and fuzzy logic sets and rules, as well as the idea of rule confidence, also known as the degree of truth. Uh, since then, though, I, in the last couple of years, I've been messing with this in a more mathematical, algebraic, information, dynamical system structure. Don't be scared. I know a lot of people out there aren't very mathematically literate. It seems like we live 300 years ago in a time when most people couldn't read a book very well. And that's where we are mathematically. Now here at the Amateur Academic, we're going to change that. We're going to do math courses one day for everybody out there to get you up on math you really need for the future. But until then, we're going to do cool diagrams and keep it chill, all right? So let's start off between two things evaluating a development or solving a problem. So how do we do that? Well, we have to break it down to properties. There, in this case, there are physical properties and there are economic properties. Now, a lot of these things might actually have something in common with each other and the separation might be 
somewhat arbitrary. So we can further reduce that down to observations. So based off that comes our observation, which we call data. Data and possible constraints are classified. This is sometimes also what's done in machine learning, okay? These observations are often called simply structured data. You can also have established constraints with a built-in degree of truth that you can take as a given to build probabilistic true uh, constraints on your structure, whether partially or completely. You can do all kinds of funky stuff with this. It's pretty cool. So now what do you do after this? Well, the structure can be mathematically mapped into a more compact or simply more understandable or legible structure through knowledge extraction. The structure of the knowledge itself can be extracted into a more compact form, either using lossy or lossless knowledge compression, okay? And even the newly generated constraints can be better weighted probabilistically using knowledge theory. With such extracted uh, structures as types of sets, rules, we can model our knowledge. Now that we've modeled our knowledge, what do we do with it? We need to do inference, okay? When we apply our knowledge, we're calling this knowledge inference. It leads to new developments or the application of new developments on problems. This knowledge inference is often probabilistic in nature, so we do the best we can, all right? Now, maybe this sounds simple, Maybe not, actually, I don't know. Is this simple? Are you following? But knowledge modeling can get very complicated very quickly, all right? Especially with the mathematics behind machine learning, classification of data, stuff like when you get into time series, calculating the information density using Shannon entropy or KS entropy approximation of dynamical systems. It gets really tricky when you need some sort of recursing branching, fuzzy sets and rules, which are then turning complete knowledge, and then also when you need more complex measures of degree of truth and mere confidence calculates for better truth and rule pruning, that's when it gets super duper hard. I should know, I've been writing the third issue of the Amateur Academic for almost two years and it's called A Mathematical Theory of Knowledge. So trust me on this one, this gets complicated guys, but we're not going to do that, okay? Instead, let's actually apply all that structure jazz I was talking about to the pharma industry. We can look at this as either a problem or development. One can lead to the other. So either we have a new development, such as a new technology, or we want to solve a problem in the pharma industry. Let's arbitrarily solve a problem to reach a development instead of the other way around. Also, keep in mind that the actual knowledge process is often nonlinear and recursive. I'm presenting it here as a nice linear fashion. So let's get into the problem of the pharma industry. Part three, solving a problem. Cost and risk of heavily regulated drug developments to the market. The problem is the increasing cost of total development to the market. Now we're very lucky here because the R&D expenses for pharma are in public filings. This current graph here, broken down between preclinical and clinical trials, is actually based off of a study from Tuck University. There was a recent study in 2016, which I can always send you, that states that the compounds abandoned versus market approval is 1.395 billion and the total pre-approval cost at a real discount of 10.5% gives a cost estimate of 2.558 billion in 2013 dollars, okay? This is an increase at an annual rate of 8.5% above general price inflation. However you slice it or dice it, we've got a complexity problem where it costs more money to get more pharma. So what about the average time currently? Well, it takes between 8 and 12 years, including 3 to 4 years pre-clinical trials. Each trial stage, by the way, costs like something like $35 million on average, so it's really expensive, and those are just the trials, okay? And even worse is when you look at the track record here of compounds. This is just, it's unbelievable. I can't believe this. It's, this is so hard, this stuff. I mean, you ask the people in the lab, really, this is hard. For every five to 10,000 compounds that enter preclinical testing, only one is approved. And these are the ones that enter preclinical testing, okay? That's why this stuff is so expensive. When you actually look at uh, the startup model of pharma, it's a different animal from regular startups. I mean, look at the way 
the funding comes in. As you can see, more and more drugs are being approved by the FDA in general. A bigger and bigger portion of that over time will be from smaller boutique and startup pharma, but at great risk. How much exactly does it cost for a pharma startup to run? It costs between one to five billion over eight to 15 years. That's a lot of money, you know, for a startup with a, such a high risk rate there of all kinds of bad things. Let's talk about those bad things, the financial risk measured by stock prices. This is where it gets scary for you guys out there in the pharma world. There's all these dramatic stock fluctuations on, on the backdrop of any news, rumors, or possibility of trials not going well. All of this for a treatment that could take 8 to 12 to who knows how many years to hit the market and then how many more to break even. It's high risk. It really is. Let's take a look at an old friend of mine that I've referenced before in my other previous videos, Juno. They should be giving me money every time I mention their name. They started off in 2013 with 120 million for a startup. Their Series A was 176 million in early 2014. By mid 2015, they had about a billion, and right now they're currently around 722 billion. They are the poster child for biotech pharma startup. What's very interesting about them also is that they have a diverse development pipeline for a pharma startup. Not only that, but they have different clinical trial stages going on for a number of treatments. So you would assume with that diversity, they're immune to any sort of problem. But let's use them as a cautionary tale right now. Although I think they're a cool company. November 23rd, 2016, they had a suspension of a phase two trial of one single treatment. Their stock plunged as much as 32% and closed down 24.5% just because of one suspension of a phase two trial out of how many did they have? Look it up yourself, be an amateur academic. But what we're talking about here is risk versus reward, and you need a diverse pipeline. If you look at the top 10 biggest farmers, they returned 88% in the last 10 years. It's a little skewed for certain reasons we won't go into, but damn. Okay, they do return a lot of money, but it's because they can afford the risk, because they have such a diverse pipeline. Um, I mean, of course, when you have succeeded at clinical trials, your stock will soar, you will get any and all capital you want, and you'll turn quarter after quarter of profits. But without a hugely diverse pipeline, lots of capital, the risk is simply too high. Failure, stock fluctuations, it is hard out there for a pharma startup. All right, so let's break it down to observe properties. Notice I skipped over physical properties because that would be like a whole nother video talking about how they do research and development and how they can do it better and cheaper and yada yada. There's a lot of research out there. I recommend you read it. Let's just get into the observations. How can we do that? Well, when we classify it, we can see that it's increasing complexity, regulations, and risks. These are the three major factors. So we're going to need to come up with a new economic and technological development to change the current model of these observations. I looked at current and recent techniques and read a lot of research papers on them. I talked to a lot of my lab rat friends out there, and in addition, I tried to probabilistically predict the price of these technologies decreasing, uh, increasing accessibility, and also the scope of their applications, as well as a rough time frame on how long this will take to be realized. I also applied the constraints we've already expressed. If you're interested in the specifics of this, just write me. I'm sure we can work something out. This all leads to a new market to explore, with many years of new developments possible to pluck up the new low-hanging fruit. What is the new pharma market? You're going to make fun of me, but it's supplements. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, okay? You mean those vitamins people take? That's not pharma. Well, it isn't yet, but it will be and it will be ripe for pharma startups to get out new products quickly on the cheap to increase the pipeline for other compounds that are more complex and require lots of time, money, and risk. There's some new technology out there that will turn the supplement industry into the pharma startup industry and give the so-called big pharma a new revenue stream in a totally new industry. So the question is, what is a supplement? Now the FDA, they actually have a great answer for this because that's their job. So kudos to them. It's added nutritional value. Yeah, that, that, that's pretty much it. Were you expecting more? Okay, well, I guess I can give you some more. 
We can talk about vitamin, mineral, herb, or other botanical amino acid substance to supplement diet, concentrate, metabolite, constitute, extract. So supplements are food in the U.S. They can be tablets, gels, powders, even liquids. You can even classify your supplement as a drink. That's what the energy drink industry does, which has certain advantages and disadvantages depending on legal requirements, FDA, blah, 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 and so on and so forth, all those wonderful, exciting rules and regulations, which I've read too much of. Let's take a break down the market. There's more than 50,000 supplements available. The projected market currently is $37 billion in the U.S., it's projected to reach $278 billion worldwide by 2024, where the U.S. will be, of course, the largest market. Uh, now, I do think that number is kind of wrong, and I have my own number. It's because they don't know about this stuff, but pff, let's not get into that. If you want to know about that, contact me. Well, the interesting thing is, though, that no company has greater than 5% of the market. That's very interesting to know, isn't it? Let's get into, first, the problem. Need of greater transparency better labeling, improved self-policing and oversight, better trials. The consumer needs to be protected and the general health of the people should be enhanced across the board by future supplements. That's priority number one. And I think the pharma industry, whether on the startup side or big pharma, they have the resources, they have the labs, they can do the tests, and they still can save money and save lives and do a great job of this. And I think that bringing them in is a really good idea. So let's take a look at actual successful Silicon Valley startups that are in the supplement industry. There's Neutro and there's Neutrobox. I can barely tell the difference between the names. Those guys need to get some better branding. Sorry about that, guys. Love what you do. Don't like your names. Uh, let's look at Neutrobox. I guess it's pronounced that way. A little feedback on that would be helpful. Almost no R&D costs. Almost no regulations. Founded on $500,000 in October 2015, $2 million in venture capital by December 2015. Now, if you look at how much money they're making right now and how much they're worth, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. So you might be asking yourself, what miracle new compound did they invent? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. They must have done something right to make all that money and be so amazing. Well, nope, they didn't. It was none. They didn't do anything new. I mean, great to them that they got this business model of supplements and were able to sell programmers who live in shacks in Silicon Valley, supplements that have a lot of caffeine in them and other things. Really shout out to them for doing that. No offense to them whatsoever. But that's just amateur hour, okay? And here at the Amateur Academic, we take pride in the amateurs out there. So good for you. But it's time for this amateur academic to go pro with this exciting new industry. So let's take it to the next level. Pharma tech development. New and amazing developments have occurred that when applied to the supplement industry can lead to great advances over current supplements. So what's one of those technologies? CRISPR, Cas9 technology. It allows for a level of biological engineering that was anywhere from costly to impossible previously. The price of this technology is following a predictable curve downward, while research using such techniques is growing exponentially. How can this be applied to botanical supplement pharmacy, an all-natural, plant-grown, dietary, super supplement industry? CRISPR plus botanics plus QTL equals future supplements. We're talking about genome editing and transcriptional regulation of botanics. And I don't know about this about the research because I couldn't find it. Maybe you know. If you know, hit me up. Uh, DNA labeling and epigenome uh, editing in botanics. Is that a thing? Can we do that? I'm pretty sure we can. What is this QTL thing? Well, that's the study of quantitative trait locus. QTL is a method for exploring genetic changes from domestication of wild plants into crops. It's a, it's a good model for doing this, and I think it can be improved a lot with machine learning and other algorithms, which I'd love to get into and talk about more, but, you know. Understanding how many generations of specific plants, given certain environmental constraints, and even on natural selection of human interactions actually changes plants in the wild or by crossbreeding will give us a better picture of how to naturally evolve botanics for desired traits much faster. Finding the most optimum structure for traits is our goal. This will have to be further researched, of course, and it's going to be hard to do because that's what the lab rats tell me. However, such research is ongoing. There are already many papers out for botanics and CRISPR. 
The price of this technology, as stated, is decreasing at a predicted level. And in the future, this will in turn allow further access and exploration while exploring low costs of R&D and scaling to mass production because we all know lab to factory, the scaling issues there. The basic research cost, though, is peanuts when compared to getting just one successful FDA-approved drug on the market with all the risks being factored in in the next 10 plus years. Think about that. It is only a matter of time before natural super supplements can be evolved to be optimal in unimaginable ways. The broad term supplement will encompass many new developments from nootropics, super supplements that help fight disease, to super supplements that can help the body to be peak physical shape for longer periods and may even help slow down or otherwise combat the process we call aging, which of course transhumanists are crazy about and generally futurists love to shout out to you guys. Working with nature is the approach that must be taken so that people will feel comfortable with such new technology. Terms like organic or all natural can in turn be used. The future of pharma can be a full of new innovation and disruptive startup models, pushing positive change and evolution in the industry. However, it is up to the industry to make these changes to do the following. Create future super supplements for pipeline diversity decreasing risk to traditional pharma R&D, profit fluctuations while making startup pharma more accessible and balancing out stock risk of other traditional compounds in the startup pipeline. With such a new source of revenue, the price of life-saving drugs can be decreased. Are you hearing me? A lot of the price hikes in life-saving drugs goes back into R&D, not just into the pockets of the greedy big pharma companies. We have to give them that, okay? You need to understand, like I said, this is a huge complexity problem. However, this new market would enable a unique opportunity for both startup and big pharma to lower the cost of drugs that will save lives. Because in the end, we're all just human and we want a better Earth healthier people. These methods could be kept strictly all natural, completely organic. The profits could also partially go to funding the big R&D projects to find future cures for very difficult to cure diseases. We've all known people who have passed from diseases that weren't curable. I know I have. It hurts me, okay? And it hurts you guys too. And it's time to really focus on making sure people can get the care they need the cures they need that yet they just don't exist yet. And I'm sure the industry can find the funding for the R&D in new markets such as the natural botanic super supplement industry. And of course, it is always important to conduct research correctly. It cannot be rushed. Consumers and their health and safety needs to always be the first priority. This is why the industry really needs to enact better self-regulation of supplements, especially in future super supplements. This can save lives and money too. Finally, you know, I'm just going to go off script here. Big Pharma, I'm talking to you and the pharma bros out there. You guys have a bad reputation. People hate you. They see you as greedy assholes. They see you as profiting off the suffering of others. It's time you step up and engineer us a better future. Okay? I know you're all just people. I know there's someone in the pharma industry, either directly or indirectly, watching this right now. It's not a personal attack on you. Just know you can take responsibility. You can step up. You can make larger profits than you thought previously with new economic and technological developments. And with that, you can have a new ability. You can save the world. I'll help you. I'll personally work with any individual or company, no matter who, if they are open to build a future for everyone. Not just the haves, but also the have-nots. Especially with these life-saving drugs, they need to be cheaper, guys. And we can make more money doing this kind of stuff 
than that with less risk and you can lower those drug prices. So please, 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 I'm begging you, okay? Stop being a farmer bro. Who owns the patent on this vaccine? Yes. The people, I, I would say, there is no patent. This is, did you patent the sun? Who owns the patent on this vaccine? There is no patent. There is no patent. Who owns the patent on this vaccine? The people. Farmer peeps out there have a chance to make a buck by not hiking life-saving drug prices. Do you hear me? But smashing into a new market full of innovation and total disruption. And on that note, I'm Bartman Sinclair. And this is the Amtrak Academy. And if you're watching this, so are you. You know, I'd just like to give a what's up to all the people on YouTube for subbing and liking. That's my blood, that's my passion. I do this for you. For all my friends, my family, all the cool random people on Facebook who like the Facebook page and show me their love. And finally, all the futurists, the transhumanists, the professors, the researchers, the companies, even the governments who watch and enjoy the Amateur Academic. I couldn't do it without you all. Let's educate, make better decisions, and build a brighter future for everybody, okay? I'd like to give a special thank you as always, to Paulina, my head lab rat, and her whole crew, all the Amble people, all those people out there. Those guys are geniuses. They need their own lab. You should hire them. If you want to hire some good people, let me know. I'll hook you up. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Paul and the Graphite people out there for being so cool to me. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Uh, Krupskaya for her support and love. And, of course, Mr. Moshni for his perseverance.